I am Susan Fulweiler, Board President of Women in Development New York. I am delighted to welcome you to the webinar from Development Assistant to President, One Woman's Journey to the Top with Emily Rafferty, President of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This webinar is co-sponsored by WID and Columbia University's Master of Science in Fundraising Management. My introduction will be followed by a conversation with Emily Rafferty and Doug White, Director of Columbia's uh, Master of Science in Fundraising Management Program. Emily is going to share her professional journey, lessons learned, and insights on today's development and nonprofit landscape. This webinar came to be because of a partnership between WID and Columbia based on some very energetic conversations that we had on how we'd like to shape the future. We know that there's a great need for strong leadership and management in the nonprofit sector, and our shared goal is to strengthen the development field and to advance the nonprofit sector. As part of this, we envision a world where more people, especially women, advance in fundraising and development to the top leadership positions, and for more women to be paid equitably to their male counterparts. When we first conceptualized this program and we thought of who we wanted to speak, the first person who came to us was Emily Rafferty. Emily is an inspiring and leading edge pathbreaker, executive, thought leader, and mentor who rose up through the ranks to the president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, our largest and most comprehensive arts organization in the United States. Emily, we are so honored to have you with us today and thank you for making this webinar a priority. Before I formally introduce <coughs> Emily and Doug, I wanted to share two brief stories of Emily's impact on others' growth and development. The first is my story. It was in 2011 when Emily spoke on a panel for WID's inaugural Executive Leadership Forum with two other presidents of leading organizations. The focus was on what are your best management tools? How do they help you build relationships? It was a sub-focus on managing the board chair and managing and being managed by the chief development officer. It was at a time in my career when I was transitioning up to a development director from a major gifts officer as an event fundraiser. And I was not exactly sure what a director of development did, but I knew I wanted to do it. And I was hungry for information, guidance, and practical experience. Emily shared some words of wisdom that was what she thought was needed for development to succeed. And they had a profound and lasting impact on me. So what did she say? She said, you need to start with good development people. Well, I think we all know that. But then she also went into what the qualities a director of development has. So she shared eight. So I wrote them down. And it um, identifies with the mission, has management skills, personal skills, and a knowledge base, is anticipatory and visionary, and has attention to detail and is focused. I wrote these down, as I said. I parroted them and grew into them until they became part of my DNA. And I wanted to share them with all, you t with all of you today as a guidepost for others as they grow and evolve and as you mentor others. The second story of Emily's impact on the growth and development of others is the Mets development staff. When we met with uh, Emily in March, um, she had just come from a party the night before with 160 people who had gathered from near and far who had worked in development over the many years. This included Nina Diefenbach, former WID board member and vice president of institutional advancement at the Met, who has worked closely with Emily for more than 30 years. In advance, they reached out to everyone and asked for words and phrases of what Emily said most frequently and that had made a lasting impression. Emily shared some with us over 10, but I'm just going to say a few. The first one was, who has the R on this, meaning responsibility? Since I heard this, this has become my new mantra. And by asking this question, has increased my productivity and efficiency, and has helped me achieve greater results in my role as Centennial Director at Helen Keller International. Two others that I thought were incredible, choose your battles, and you have to look at the big picture. I know we've all heard these things, but we have to remember they're critical in gaining perspective when we are in the thick of things. These are gems of wisdom for us all, and I know that we're going to hear more today. Now I'm going to introduce Emily and Doug. Emily Rafferty joined the Met in 1976 as an administrator in the development department and rose through the ranks, serving as vice president for development and membership, the first woman to be named vice president at the Met, and later a senior vice president for external affairs before becoming president, again the first woman, where she served for 10 years until just last month. As the museum's president, what did she do exactly? She was in charge of fundraising and administration. She oversaw day-to-day -day operations, an annual operating budget of more than 300 million, and a staff of 1,500. 
She is credited with financially shepherding the museum through a period of sustained growth and is known for her skill in dealing with trustees and other philanthropists whose donations have stoked the Met's growth in areas like boosting its attendance to 6.2 million visitors a year from 4.8 million in 2008. In Emily's spare time, she serves as the chairwoman of NYC and Company, the city's tourism and marketing agency, is a board member of the National September 11th Memorial and Museum, and is chairwoman of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Truly amazing. She has numerous awards, but I thought I'd name a few. In 2005, she received Women in Development's Woman of Achievement Award on the occasion of our 25th anniversary. And I will note, it was just when she became president of the Met, and uh, so we're 10 years later. In 2012, she received New York University's Lewis Rudin Award for exemplary service to New York City, and just recently received Boston College's Distinguished Alumni Award, the highest award bestowed upon an alumni. Now about Doug White, who I have great respect and admiration for. Doug, as I noted earlier, is the director for the Master of Science and Fundraising Management Program at Columbia. He has deep experience in the fundraising field, as well as long list of publications and significant lecturing experience to his credit, as well as four books. He has over 30 years of a leadership experience at nonprofits, as well as academic experience teaching courses in philanthropy and fundraising. His many honors include receiving the Distinguished Service Award from the National Capital Planned Giving Council in Washington, D.C. He has led organizations in developing ethics and strategic planning policies, donor relations, planned and major giving, and capital campaigns, and is responsible for efforts that have raised more than $800 million. I am delighted to turn the program over to Doug. Thank you, Susan, and welcome to everyone who's listening in and viewing right now. And Emily, I would like to welcome you to Columbia University and to our program here for fundraising management. It's a great pleasure to join you here, and uh, thank you, Susan, for that great introduction. Those eight uh, points that you make, I think, apply to so many places, but certainly do to the field of, of fundraising, and we all strive toward them every day. It's going to be hard to encapsulate everything you've done, so what I'm going to try to do in this time that we have together is to find out some things that are important to you, get a little bit uh, of an idea of what's inside your head as well as what's inside your heart, because you have had an extraordinary career. And let me begin by just asking you from the perspective you have today, what is your uh, thinking as to the health of the nonprofit world today? I think um, the nonprofit world has achieved incredible maturity uh, over the tenure that I have been involved in it, which is now a little bit more than 40 years, actually. And I say that because our institutions have become more complicated, they have become more global. Um, the responsibilities and the geography and the demographics that they serve more complex. So in part it's because they've needed to. And in part, I think it's because they have really attracted, not that they always didn't, but they have attracted uh, very, very professionally trained people to work um, in their administrations. And it varies throughout the nonprofit world depending on what the, the area is as to the maturity factor. But uh, certainly coming into culture when I did in the 1970s, I would say it was very embryonic and has matured incredibly. And, and so overall, I think you see a great potential for the nonprofit sector and a great level of maturity. You come from an extraordinary organization, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, one of the most storied organizations in the world. How does that make you feel when you get up in the morning and you say, I'm the president of this organization? Does that humble you? Does it take you to places? How does that make you feel? Uh, it always makes me feel very proud, for sure. It always uh, has been with me every day, too. I feel a very big responsibility to continue to make it better and to always strive for excellence at every single level of the institution. And I think that's shared um, in the mission and the people who serve it. So while um, it's, it's absolutely exhilarating from the point of view of its collections, I also, uh, given my perspective, look at it for those areas where we need to uh, work even harder. I'm thinking of when I go into the lobby there and see all of these people and so many people from all over the world, 
and I know you've done the same thing, you've walked through there, but you have that distinct place. You're the president of this organization <laughs> and you're seeing how many people who are being affected by this. Um, how does that fact make you feel? Again, you know, it's enormously humbling, in fact, to see that, but it's also pleasurable. Um, at the same time, that, that um, sense of responsibility really permeates uh, the job. You know, I see the visitor who's lost and want to make sure they find their way, or I see, uh, um, you know, uh, papers on the floor, or I see wayfinding that can be improved. So I'll always look at, at it from, from that perspective. But I do stop and breathe often as I'm walking through the galleries and uh, watch that individual person encounter a work of art. And it really doesn't get better to see the sense of discovery come alive right before you. We oftentimes think of people who are the heads of major organizations as special people. And in many ways, they really are. But they've worked to get to where they are, for the most part. They have begun, oftentimes, in places that aren't at the highest levels. And I can't think of a better example than you to have that story told, because you obviously have never, uh, haven't always been the president of the museum. Uh, in fact, you started out uh, as a fairly uh, modest uh, job holder at the time when you came. When did you start at the at the, uh, I started in January of 1976 as an administrative assistant in the development office. Um, barely knew how to spell it or what it did. I wanted to be in arts education and there wasn't an opening, but I knew enough to know I needed to learn how to raise money and I got in there and I never looked back. And My desk had four or five piles on it, the applications, uh, the responses, the thank you notes, the um, the quill pen to record the gifts when they came in. And then uh, in the evening at 5.30 or 5 o'clock, it all transformed himself into another whole day, which became night of events and members and entertaining and, and all of that that, that uh, pulled me forward. Uh, but that's what it was like. It was very, very embryonic. Um, this guy was the limit in a way because we hadn't done this before. Uh, the museum was new at doing it. We had a membership program. We had a fantastic woman who ran that and, and the beginning years of development. So we experimented a lot and um, worked with other institutions to, to um, see how we could help each other and was mentored and now try to mentor back. But it was a very, very different environment. It was before a lot of the compliance, a, a lot of the, in, in a way, the restrictions that face us now um, although there were some men, but it was exciting times. Of course, I, I recall it with um, almost 40 years of memory bank, so I probably eliminated a little of the bad days. <laughs> <laughs> but take us a little bit deeper into that environment there. For example, how many women were in your space at that point? Uh, at that point, uh, in the membership office, of which there were probably 10 people, there was one man, and the development, there were none. And over the years, we've had a number of men in the um, development field, but by far, it has been, uh, been women that have uh, prevailed in terms of numbers uh, at the Met. And certainly in arts organizations, uh, not so different. Certainly plenty of men that have, have entered the, the field and wonderful ones, but if you look at the total demographics, I think you'll see um, overwhelmingly women at the party that Susan just referenced, which brought back almost 200 people who'd worked for me over the years at the Met, 80% of them probably were women. So at the time that you began, there were a good number of women working in the Met at that uh, Well, office. in the development field, there were three of us, uh, so that wasn't uh, a big group at all. But membership, which had been in place since the founding days of the museum, probably had 10, including everybody. So then you shifted over from membership to development at some point. What was driving that decision? They've always been together. Their, their, um, their data banks have always been together. We look at membership and development as a single human being who has their life matriculate through the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So whether you're a donor, whether you're a member, whichever door you come through, we, um, we welcome you through. Uh, one domain as far as we're concerned. So I really didn't transfer from one to the other, although we've had staff that work more partic particularly in, in, each, 
in each area. But I think the answer to your question for me really came as we begin to see some of these programs become real ones that need to be uh, run effectively, like a real estate council, like a corporate patron program, like a younger members program, a large donors program, serious uh, foundation uh, and grant giving from corporations. These all really emerged in uh, the early 1980s. That was really a nascent time for many development offices. People think of places like Columbia, for example, and many other large organizations as, as having had these sophisticated programs going for some time, many, many decades. And in fact, it was really the 1970s through the 1980s where a lot of our current techniques were founded and, and, and experimented on. Did you feel like you were part of a new wave of development when you came into the development uh, office at the time? We certainly envisioned the universities as knowing it all. And uh, so my view of all of you at that time was, can we get there, at least get to where they're going? Because culture was really a little bit, um, you know, people were doing their thing. I'm not saying it wasn't going on. And, and, and performing arts, of course, were concentrating on subscriptions and ticket selling and, and all of that. So we really emerged together, I think, as a great a national universe of culture in the 1980s, uh, um, looking to the universities as ahead of us be, by virtue of their alumni basis and the fact that they had people already that even if they hated where they went to school, they couldn't get out of the fact that they went there. Whereas if you were a member of any of our organizations and we do something that blows your mind wrong, you can walk away from us. Um, we like to think that you won't, you'll give us another chance. But the truth of the matter that that's where the shifting tides, I think, uh, emerged in, in our spaces. Well, I think you're right. A lot of universities think they know everything. <laughs> when, especially when it comes to development. Uh, but the other side of that coin is that a lot of universities do it very well. Uh, but even those who do it well today were just learning how to do it like they do it today in those early days of the 1970s and 1980s. It wasn't back, for example, in the 1800s or something when we think of these storied places, and I'll use Columbia as an example, uh, that has had its act together all the time. It's just not been that way. So I think that during the 1970s and 1980s, at least in my experience, we saw a lot of innovation and a lot of new energy. And I'm hearing you say that that was also part of what was going on at the Met at the same time. I do think, though, we have to go back farther into that space of the late 19th century because for many of us, that's where the roots of our organizations are. And they emerged out of a growing sense of uh, the Alamazanary environment and philanthropy and founding most fathers, as we call them, founding fathers of the Metropolitan Museum who were inspired by the museums and what had happened in Europe and thought that America should have repositories of great art. So when you take the Metropolitan Museum of Art, for instance, well over 90% of the art in the institution from those days right through the present are through gifts from people who are giving works of art in themselves or giving the, the funds for us to acquire works of art. So our roots of where we were um, really surfaced from that time. And as we go and we are we're sought after by our European, our Asian, and our international friends, uh, this is really the core of where I begin the story because it is, it is, it's seated in the very missions of our institutions. So while we became more perfected and, and understood the reality of needing um, more funds to sustain our operations in the 70s and 80s that existed. They were just financed through smaller groups of people and in some cases regional cities around the country, but they surfaced as institutions that would absolutely need to grow their revenue sources in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So that is true. You're reminding me of uh, the importance of our history at any organization. Uh, tell me, when did the Metropolitan Museum of Art come to be? How did, and how did that happen? We are 1870, along with some of the, 
the great institutions in New York City that were right of that era, places like the New York Historical Society, the Museum of Natural History, the New York Public Library, and, and many, many others that I, I couldn't cite them all. And again, I think they came and they immersed out of the Industrial Revolution and this um, world of, of the melting pot of America, of, of the need to begin to capture our history, which was becoming quite profound at that point, post-Civil War, a lot of history that, that was behind us. And so you see libraries, cultural institutions begin to, to surface, many of them modeled on their European counterparts. And we were, we were in, that, in that group defining and developing our mission alongside of the great universities like Harvard and Columbia that were in some cases uh, centuries earlier. Well, it's just an amazing path back to those beginnings because 1870 New York was a very different place. And I suspect that creating this organization was a brand new venture, not only from a physical perspective, but also from a psychological one for the people in New York and by extension, the people of America. And it set a tone for a new understanding of what art can play in society. Is that what the founders felt would happen, do you think? or? Do you have any sense of what happened in those closed doors? I'm sure that whether they felt it or they experienced it, it certainly was part of the vision that they, that they had to have seen because they believed in it fervently. We had some of the giants in, in corporate uh, America and some of the great women of our day uh, decide that the Metropolitan Museum of Art was extremely important for the city and the nation to have and that they themselves would support the trustees, the donors, people like uh, J.P. Morgan, Lewisine Havemeyer, many, many others later, Lila Atchison Wallace and many more donors that I could possibly mention now uh, in, our, in our current times, hugely, hugely generous, uh, generous people. And they are the ones that I have known are all people of great vision, of great belief in uh, the, the, the power of art to inform, to, uh, to, to solve uh, a person's personal crises through just being able to look at art and to uh, be renewed and restored by it, as well as its, its a great ability to, to teach. And I think one way or another, they all divine those, divined and devised those visions in their own way. So yes, I think that, that that's true. And I will say that one of the first pieces of art to come in the museum was a great sarcophagus. And right from the start, it had a little chunk that was made so that people could drop coins in it. So from the start, I think our founding fathers realized that uh, we were always uh, going to need support, and we do. Holding on to those beginning days and never letting people forget. I think exactly. that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Well, let's go. You've gone from membership to development, and I want to know what this world of development was like in those days. Today we have so much technology behind us and we have databases that help us understand where donors are and how much they've given and where they've moved to, who they've married and the children they have. Tell us a little bit about the environment of the development office when you first went into it. And by the way, what, what year was that when you went from membership to development? Well, actually it was, it was together. I started in development, but membership was, was the, the woman who was my boss oversaw development and membership. So just to be clear, it was, it was an entity, but I was working more directly in, um, in the development area. You know, and by the way, that's still the case, correct? With membership and development are in the same? They are, okay. yeah. They are, there's, they are under the, the same rubric, uh, and as their databases are and so forth. You know, it's interesting, while it's matured and all the things that happen that we know who are in the field, um, it's true, it's in a different place. In many ways, though, it still is all around the individual human being and uh, the care and the relationships that one builds. And I think for me, that's been why I have loved the field so much. It's been an opportunity to meet people from all over the world and uh, to become personal friends with them. And if it worked for them to give to the Met, it's a place they wanted to matriculate and be and that they could find joy with us that was terrific. And if, if I and my colleagues in the development field could make that happen, that was what we considered to be the most important. 
So it was our job, and it continues to be our jobs, to really understand our missions and to be able to speak to them effectively and with great passion and with great conviction so that the people who come into our spaces and then we meet, no matter where we are, whether it's in a, a Central Park or in, um, you know, in Queens and Staten Island in, in, in Spain or in India, to be able to convey that, that wonderful just illumination and, and, and infectious uh, commitment to it. That's really what it is. And then after that, it becomes all of the places where people can get involved and what might interest them. And if they have a passion for a certain art or a certain subject in academia, that that's where they might find themselves. But the very basic that is the reason for those of us who love the field are in the field is because of people. And I always say to people, if it isn't the Met that really turns you on, and I like to think that it will be, but it's often not. And sometimes people have real love for medicine. They've had experience in the family or education or whatever it is. I feel it's equally my responsibility to make sure I can do my best to find some place for them that will make them happy from an Alamosnery point of view, where they can find great pleasure and you know, leave them with, certainly hope you'll be a member of the Met and come and enjoy us, but so glad that you know, you've chosen to give to Columbia University if that's what's going to give them support and give you joy. And that's what it's about. It's understanding the world is a place of great need and there are a lot of people out there who want to help in helping them find what works and helping us find for our institutions, in my case, the Met, um, as many people as possible that really find joy during their life with us. And when the doors open every morning, they want to be in our galleries. That's what it's about, really. The rest of it comes along as tools, as ways that we can facilitate it and uh, embrace now the whole world. I think the biggest difference, you know, in answer to your question is that it's, it's moved into a space that as development people, we truly need to nurture and understand, and that is the global stage. Because we're all out there, technology has completely changed how development is done and what we do. And so, alongside of what I just said about the people, it's really continuing our own education about how we can best bring our institutions uh, so that, that people are understanding us and that there's knowledge out there and that we can take a person who wants to join a board and show them how they can get there because there is a great, great desire for people to be involved and there's a big gap still as, as great as the tools are out there, there's still a very big gap between how people can go from wanting to be engaged to being engaged and knowing how to get there and I do believe it's the field of development that can, can really help people do that. I'm hearing you focus on the individual, and I want to go back to that because it's so important, at least it is in my own view, and I'm hearing you say it is true in yours. A place like the Met, world-renowned, lots and lots of people support it. Is it really that important to stay in touch with anybody in particular? Well, my view is that the degree to which I could t stay in touch with everybody, I would. Uh, you know, it's just, you just don't know. Um, I have found in the last eight months since I announced I was going to be retiring from the Met, people I haven't seen in years from whom I have received emails, letters, reminding me of a time when I met them, however briefly it was. And I'm not saying this only about myself, I'm just answering your question, that it wasn't notes and letters only from people who were people that were able to give huge gifts to the museum. It was people who remembered their visit because they called and something was closed and we opened it for them. Or, or small moments where they had somebody and they needed a little help with an internship. It was, it's just been all over the map. I can't even describe to you how many I have received. So I do think it's about those people you know, obviously our trustees who are working with us so much, we're caring deeply about them, and we spend a lot of time with them. And that's, that's kind of a, an umbilical uh, attachment. It's a partnership, and those are people that we spend more and more time with. Uh, our large donors who make possible so much 
in the place, but I know they understand, as, as we all do, that it doesn't diminish the power of the people. The international friends that I have uh, been given the pleasure to be in contact with, consul generals, ambassadors who come through New York and live in our space for four years, making sure that our collections are available to them and their communities and that they know our curators and that their time is well spent, um, that gives, for me anyway, a great amount of pleasure as, as, as whatever. And I, I, by the way, have gotten to know visitors in the galleries by just chatting with them and you know, having an email connection for when they next come to New York or people who are involved in smaller foundations and they need help in knowing how to matriculate through the New York City environment and pick charities that are going to work for them. And our development people do that all the time. It's, it's, it's a universal assist and I do believe in that and I do believe that in putting that in practice, the rivers of this whole city rise higher. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because in our classes, we do uh, pay a lot of attention to the idea that every individual is important and not just from a fundraising perspective but in a fundraising perspective every individual is still important and we have to remember that because today what we're seeing is such attention given to the only the high net worth individuals and of course we want their support and we want to nurture them and help them understand the purpose of our cause but so many people, the masses of people who are only able to give on a modest level are still very important to not only uh, giving us money, but also supporting us from a, a mission perspective. So to hear you say that you're getting these letters from people years and years ago that you knew and had contact with, that's a warming feeling, and I suspect it is for you too. Uh, for sure, and, and I mention it because I think it demonstrates the question you were asking. A place like the Met, that's such a public institution, we also really, really um, accentuate and have as our, one of our top priorities accessibility and accessibility to communities, not only New York communities, very diverse communities, national communities and international communities. And whether or not they wind up giving us um, a contribution at the door, which they do, and then become more involved in the institution, the fact of the matter that they've come to the museum, that they've had an experience, that will take it away, that will send a message throughout the world. And a big concentration now for us at the Met is digital media. It is at on the top of Tom Campbell, our director's uh, agenda of making sure that we are maximizing the abilities of digital media to to uh, present our collections. And um, having borrowed or in fact now taken from you, Sri Srinivasan from Columbia, who is overseeing that for the Met, who's an extraordinary human being and has really, really broadened our, our understanding and our base to do this. So it's all of these tools that, that we build around ourselves, but at the end it does come to, to having the people experience the collections of the Met and to find their own roots there, which anybody will do who comes to the Met. Now this is a very different story from the medical community, in fact, but as I talk to my friends there, not so entirely different, accessible in medicine to so many different areas of the, of the city, to making sure that the diseases that we put so much money into research, that these are being um, disseminated to wider communities. I think that's, again, at the core of what development does and makes possible. Well, thank you for that, because I totally agree with that, and, and it's a good perspective that you have. You mentioned a moment ago that you have some ongoing relations with other museums throughout the world, that you're getting to be more global. Let me just ask, for example, if you've been working with the Louvre on any programs, and what are you doing with other... Well, I should like say that? that there is a long history of museums, not only the Met, but all of us, primarily originally in, in Europe, and uh, in America, there's a long period of, of lots of back and forth. We borrow and we lend to each other all the time. The great exhibitions that you've seen at the Met and other uh, museums around Europe all engage us in uh, uh, the transfer of knowledge, helping each other with conservation training, with um, research, and so forth. And we've expanded widely in the Met very early on into museums all over the world. We've been engaging with museums in China for decades 
and exchange loan programs through works of art, exhibitions from the Met going there, China coming here. That's true of India and throughout Asia, certainly Japan, where we've had uh, extensive uh, work with increasingly as they open up uh, places in the Emirates where we do exchange um, studies and so forth. And you watch the universities who, who've certainly done done this uh, extensively as well. So this is not new and it continues. So I, uh, in the case of Louvre or the big, the big European museum, on any given day, you will always find us doing something with these museums. Our curatorial base is over 110, 120 curators, well over 100 conservators, educators, librarians. I mean, they're, they're a universe of people. And one of our big focuses now is in the Middle East on our colleagues in Syria and Iraq, Iran, Israel, all of these places that are facing very, very serious um, uh, situations and where we've been working with their museums for years in times of, of peace and um, and now working again where we can with them, where our curators all know each other. So that is very solid. That has always been a very, very great source of, of strength and also of communication. And you know, a lot of us always say that when um, all else, when languages fail in the diplomatic community, which I'm not saying they that often do, do, but they do turn to the language of culture, the universal one that um, doesn't necessarily only needs words, but like music, speaks for, for itself just by virtue of what it is. I hope somebody in our audience has written that last phrase down. There couldn't be a better apologia for the teaching of arts and the understanding and appreciation of the arts culture in, in the world than that. So thank you for that thought. Uh, speaking of international, I just have to tell you that I was speaking with one of our graduates of the program and he's at Oxford University, and he told me that he uh, has about a dozen people from Oxford University listening in because they understand, and as uh, we are learning, uh, uh, the importance of the international community when it comes to not only distributing information about the arts and whatever else we do as an organization, but also in fundraising. So we welcome people not only from New York and even the United States, but from around the world as well. I would stop you there. The Met just welcomed in the last two weeks 15 uh, directors, international directors, for a two-week period. A program uh, launched by Tom Campbell, our director now in its second year. We're learning from these directors, and they're hopefully learning from us, sharing all kinds of ways to administrate and run our museums. And part of the program, I believe, was those of you in the audience from Oxford, your director was with us uh, in the last, one of those people in the last couple of weeks. Well, so we are sharing our knowledge. We're working with our college, colleagues internationally. And uh, it goes back to um, how much we learn from each other. None of us have it down perfectly and everyone has our own particular problems, but they're broad enough and they're universal enough so that the dialogue between us is always, always uh, effective. Well, thank you for that. It's a small world, it's incredible. Uh, that was not scripted. I didn't have any idea that was the case, but uh, welcome to the people who are from other countries to this broadcast. I sit in front of an entire incoming class every year, or stand, I should say, and I'm speaking to about 80% to 85% women every year. Women are becoming a larger and larger part of the world of nonprofits and the world of fundraising. And I tell them, I want them to want to be leaders. <coughs> I don't want to define what that means to them, but I want them to aspire to leadership so that they can be a big part of changing the world for the better. Let's say you were in that same meeting. Emily, I want to just plop you in for a moment. And you're talking to these young women, some men, but a lot of them are women. What would you say uh, they should aspire to? What, what do you think uh, is, is possible for women in philanthropy today? I think it's um, the world is possible for everybody in philanthropy these days. For women, um, I would say to you, go for it. Um, a couple of things I, I would definitely stay at the start. Make sure from the very beginning you wind up in an organization or a cause that you truly care about. It's a field like many, I know, but you really, really work hard and you have to give it your all. And you may go for years, 
without seeing necessarily a great promotion, because sometimes that's not how the system works. So the expectations, I think, have to be realistic. And then when you get in there, um, leadership, no matter what you're doing, is something that uh, you learn. You have to have, I think, national, uh, natural proclivities. There are a lot of things I'm really terrible at, really terrible at. But I always knew that I could be a leader if I had the right people to look to. So I would say to you, look around and see who you respect uh, in the organization or outside of the organization. Just look around. Go into a mall and who's running that store? Who's in the halls? Who's in the, in the, in the stacks? And look around how they're treating people, how they're behaving, what their rhythm of timing is. You'll learn a lot about leadership by just looking around, not even in your own space of work. And then setting the important priorities, understanding the mission of the institution. And look around and see what needs to be done. And then don't go diving into somebody else's turf. Just wait and see and watch how it's happening. And offer maybe some ideas or see if you can help. Go out for a coffee, find out, learn about what it is that that area is doing and see if you might lend something to it. And everything takes time. Uh, that that I, I can't emphasize enough. And then just make sure you're honing all of those skills. You've got to love people and take that person. A lot of times over the years, I've just played games with myself. I've been with people at a lunch or wherever in an environment and they're really angry. Sometimes they've been really angry at the Met. And I've just said, okay, this is going to take a little time, but I'm really going to see if I can, what is making this person angry? And if it's really us, can we fix it? Fix it? And if it's not us, how can we, can we help them bring them along? And those are kinds of things that have taught me leadership skills, because it's in these people and finding what ticks about them and why things are wrong that help you learn the right about things. So look in the corners that you might not anticipate have learning and do find those mentors right away. They're there for you. They might necessarily be people that are twice your age and sometimes they are. And then when you learn a little, turn around and go teach that to somebody else because the field needs new people coming in all the time. And uh, some people don't understand that the nonprofit sector is really one that, that welcomes people. And people do make a choice because uh, you mentioned pay and you mentioned parity. And oftentimes it's a, it is a, a financial choice when you enter the nonprofit sector. But um, it often can lead to ways where you can make a comfortable lifestyle. And I see that it does. You mentioned pay just a moment ago, and that's a question I was going to ask you. I can tell these young women that there are opportunities out there, and let's say they follow your advice, and I love the idea about being patient. That's true for everyone, especially when you're playing the long game. And by the way, patience is not my first name, as anybody <laughs> knows, but I, um, I have really tried. We can work on those qualities <laughs> that we need to. But getting back to the pay question here, let's say I can tell these people, and you can too, that there are opportunities out there. Is it so certain they'll be, get paid what they need to get paid, at least on a level that uh, men would get paid doing the same thing? That's the bigger question around you know, this whole country, and it doesn't necessarily you know, limit itself to one sector of the country uh, more than another. But I think we've, we've come a long way as women. I'm not Pollyanna, and I think every generation um, needs to speak up about it. It is not something that's going to go away, and we each have to play our part. I happen to have grown up at the age where many of you are now. I was uh, witnessing the Vietnam War. I was witnessing the great flags raised by Gloria Stein and Brady Frieden, people that we look to now as, as great mentors, as great champions, as great, great trailblazers. And they have um, done tremendous amounts for us, as well as many, many other women who have then gone on to be in politics or in business. And each of us would say, not that I put myself with these people, but I think just in terms of, of age and, and place in my life, that it's something that needs to be paid attention to all of the time. 
uh, I think that those of us who are in places where we can make these kinds of things happen have to be looking at it very carefully. I haven't been perfect at it, but I've been attentive to it. I've spoken about it. Um, I have definitely tried to be uh, in panels and in and, and public uh, about it. Um, and I think there's certain levels of ranks of women as they go through where parity, it reaches more parity than at other levels. But um, all of you who are women, it is, it is an issue. I don't have the solution. Uh, the more and more that we can see women in CEO roles around the country and, and on um, corporate boards, I think that we will see this change and move. And I really believe um, that we can thank for where we are some of the great um, women who have been uh, senior people in their ranks uh, across corporate America. And, and I have the greatest respect for many of them. I've come to know many of them. And uh, that's where all of you need to aspire to. One of the cherished relationships we have at the Graduate School of uh, Fundraising Management here at Columbia is that with women in development. Uh, Susan is the person who began the show here a little while ago. And she is with Women in Development. And that's a great organization. And one of the questions they're dealing with is this one. And I would recommend anyone who uh, can think about um, this issue to, and who's in development or is, cares about uh, nonprofit development to examine uh, that organization. Uh, and there are several organizations throughout the world. Uh, there's a big one in New York City, the one that we are affiliated with, but there are several throughout the United States and elsewhere. And so if you can affiliate yourself with that, join that organization, uh, then I urge you to do so because um, that we need, and I'm a guy <laughs> and I'm saying this, we need uh, women to not only lead, uh, to be equal leaders uh, of our nonprofit world, but also to be paid uh, with parity. And uh, to me, it's such an obvious uh, observation. It's, it's, it's even hard to even think that I'm saying it or that I'm saying it in the context that there's a problem. But uh, if we put our minds to it, don't you think we can do something about that, Emily? I think we can. I also think we have uh, a long way to go in diversity of women in, the, in um, uh, the workforce at very senior levels. Just women in the workforce, diversity of women, and parity and remuneration. Um, still big, big, um, big jobs ahead of us. Okay, well let's go on to another topic here because we, we know that that one's out there and we'll be dealing with that for a while. But I wanted to get back to you for a minute and your personal journey as you've gone through the Met. Tell me about some of the people that you've met, some of the uh, experiences that you've had that, uh, that uh, you remember and, uh, and that have affected you over the time. Well, you know, sometimes they're, they're collective um, and sometimes they're around individuals. But uh, there, there are several that, that I tell that are enormously powerful. Um, but in recent history, most people um, uh, are alive now, many that experienced 9-11. So for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the city crashed, of course, everything shut down dramatically. And while we know a lot now, we knew nothing then. So we didn't know why it happened, what it was, or if there was more to come. So the fear factor was huge. But nevertheless, the day after 9-11, the then Mayor Giuliani called us at the Met uh, then director Philippe de Montebello and uh, uh, a few of us that were there and said, if it's possible, can you get the Met open tomorrow? Because if we can get the Met open, the world will know that New York is back, that we can get this city back and running. Well, the thought of it was unbelievably daunting because it was long before any kind of email or anything and we'd had sent most people, certainly the public, away, as many staff members home as we could. And the thought of getting the place open in less than 24 hours was, uh, we looked at each other and never thought it would be possible. But that's the mat. That's the people there. Everybody just divided it up, figured out how to do it. Security, education, visitor services, all the public places that had to open. Um, and through uh, volunteers, through 
phone messaging and systems or whatever, the next morning we opened the doors. We had not publicized it at all because we didn't know if we were going to be able to open. So we just opened the doors. And as the day went on, we opened as many galleries as we could as guards were able to turn up and we were able to do that. But just opening the doors with nobody being told we were going to be open, thousands of people, thousands just came crashing through. And so uh, we were completely overwhelmed. Why did they come? They assumed we were going to be there for them. But the real reason they were there was to go through the galleries and to be reaffirmed and have affirmation that life does go on, that time and again mankind has survived whatever the horrific natural disasters or man-made disasters. And the arts in our galleries, encyclopedic through the beginning of time, were there to remind them of that. And also finding the Met as a place and a source of renewal and comfort and uh, a place to, to find oneself again. And we added music programs and poetry readings. And, and, then, and then the lights began to go on in the city and many other institutions were opening by the next day. That was one of the most profound collective moments in my uh, life at the Met. Another uh, was um, for children and, and expanding the museum for young people. And this is even at the upper levels of membership in a different different kind of sphere, if you will. But we had very, very defined membership programs and members were at certain levels and they came in and they came from six to eight and the kids came home and by this time I had children that were six to eight or whatever they were, but in that range and lots of friends who had it. So why aren't we opening this place to children in the evenings, inviting them to come to members' events, expanding this place for nighttime? And everybody was a man right that time in the senior ranks of the museum. So I put it forward. They questioned me, but they probably knew better than to stop me. And um, anyway, we did it. And we opened up the new arms and armor galleries and we invited kids and I looked outside and kids were coming up the avenues and they came in and we didn't have one incident of anybody running anywhere inappropriately and it was one of the moments where it expanded our thinking to nightlife at the museum for kids of all ages and that this can really work and there were many other incidences many other ideas but it was uh, a profound one and then I'll just offer too I have had as I said earlier in this conversation the opportunity to meet very important people from around the world, royals, heads of state, ambassadors, consul generals. Um, because the Met being such a diverse collection, these people come. And so one story that I love to tell was for the Emperor and Empress of Japan who came for uh, the occasion of the um, award of the um, uh, Imperiali Award, which is a huge architectural award in Japan, and they came on the occasion of that. This is a long time ago now, and it was before I was president, but I was in charge of external affairs. So um, they were high risk, you know, security, so they came in through the main security entrance. And in Japanese protocol, with all due respect to my Japanese friends who might be listening, there is enormous protocol and very, very honorable and appropriate protocol around their royal highnesses. Um, but they came in through um, the security entrance and I greeted them with our security head and we got on an elevator to go upstairs in the back of the house and the elevator broke. And um, so it wasn't going anywhere. And the empress, I'd read around about her and she'd gone to the Sacred Heart School in Tokyo and I'd gone to the Sacred Heart School here in New York and they all have very, very absolutely similar traditions. And so just making conversation, I said to her, you know, that I knew she'd gone to the Sacred Heart in Tokyo. So we were able to talk about that. And then she said, um, you know, if there's a staircase, we're, we're, we're fine, we could take the stairs. And by that time, they'd found another elevator and we came up the other elevator. But since that was another elevator and hadn't gotten security clearance and everything, when the elevator door opened, there were all of these gentlemen in various arrays of undress because they were the waiters for the dinner that night and they were putting on their black ties and getting themselves all organized <laughs> and there they were 
And there was no choice but to get out of the elevator with the emperor and empress into this ray of, of, of gentlemen who uh, were totally stunned, but we just kept on walking through. And the empress was so gracious. She turned to me and she said, we never get to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went on and, and it was just a lovely personal moment. And by it, I mean to say that with all of these people I've had the great honor of meeting, it always comes down to humanity. People are people, every single one of them. They have their good days and their frustrating days. They, they get nervous, they laugh, they cry. They care about their kids more than anything. They're, this is the way it is. And it's probably the most profound and long-term lesson I will take with me um, with all of these wonderful people. Princess Diana spent an evening with her. The same thing, uh, many, many um, heads and royals, and I, I don't mean to to um, to go on except to say you asked the question and these were the moments and as profound uh, uh, is taking a group through the museum who might have, um, have, have, have various impairments or impediments or hospital audiences and are, are um, injured people or people that, that um, perhaps have dementia or whatever who we are finding are very successful in looking at works of art as a way of healing or at least coping. And so these personal experiences with these groups are equally, equally a profound in my experience. Well, I was hung up there for a while on, on the children and nighttime and then I thought of movies that have been made about this. And I suspect that <laughs> your exhibitions do not come to life at nighttime, but maybe they do, I don't know. I suspect in the minds of children they might, and it's a, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful feeling. But then uh, I'm well, they stopped. They do actually. They, um, you know, we're night and day. We have over 600 events a year in the evening at the Met after hours uh, in all the areas, all the collections for for our Friday and Saturday evening opening hours for everybody to various levels of membership to parts of the international community, like the directors that we had last week or larger visiting scholars and scientists and conservators. So it is a 24-7 institution, actually. Well, it's a fabulous institution. And then to just have this visual of the elevator door opening <laughs> to all of these uh, semi-dressed men, I suspect it was uh, an occasion for both sides to uh, see the humanity of each. I expect they're still telling that story. <laughs> they're telling that story. <laughs> well, they should be. <laughs> That's a good story. And uh, it's one that we're going to pretty much end on because we don't have a lot of time left, but I do want to tell you that um, Emily is a fabulous human being and she was involved uh, with one of the gifts, and I just want to end this here with this gift story where someone, Leon Levy, gave a major gift to the institution and then there was a question between him and Philippe de Montebello about how long his name would be a part of that gift. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, first I would say it was a very much a shared gift of Leon Levy and Shelby White, his wife, and Shelby continues as a very, very active and effective member of our board. Um, so this was something that they, they did together. And I think um, what you're getting at here is the conversation with donors that everybody uh, is having in the academic and throughout the nonprofit sector, and that is when one gives a gift and when it's for a naming opportunity of a particular space, as opposed to an endowment, which can go on in perpetuity, what does perpetuity and what does time mean? In the case of, of Leon Levy and Shelby White, they believed that an institution should, after a certain period of time, be able to move on and rename a space because institutions move on and they need um, refurbishment, they have new life and new people. So the conversation there was what is, what is the right period of time? Is it 50 years? Is it 75 years? Is it 25 years or whatever it was? And so that was a, a conversation in which they arrived at a, a mutually agreeable um, a period of time. And so it, it is something that, that all of our institutions look at, donors who are trustees for one institution and are looking at it with other institutions. And it's a, it's, it's a conversation that's extremely relevant in fundraising sectors today. Is that, that fair, I think? It is, and I think that's a great ending to the story because they both agreed that at some point 
Uh, another donor might come along and want to rename that same space. We had that same situation just recently uh, with Lincoln Center here in New York, and uh, luckily it's going to be named uh, for someone, uh, David Geffen, for the next 50 or 100 years, who knows, but uh, organizations have to deal with this all the time, and so do donors. Do you think you have to mention there that the important thing is that all of our donors trust us? and that at the end of the day, if you have an agreement with any of us, you can trust us to live by it, not change it without a conversation that is mutually agreeable. And I think I feel in the 40 years that I've been at the Met, I feel that we have been true to that. I can't think of a better thought to end this conversation. The trust that we all have in these institutions uh, in whom society puts much trust. And I think the Met is an outstanding example of that. I would like to thank Susan Fulweiler from Women in Development for being such an engaging partner for us here at Columbia at the Fundraising School, at the Master's Program for Fundraising Management. And I want to, on her behalf and as well as on mine, uh, Emily, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for taking the time to be with us today. Great, great pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me.